Hello, everyone, and welcome to day three of the EFMD Global Fair by Hired. My name is Amber Wigmarovitz, Chief Talent Officer of Hired, and it's a great pleasure to be your host for the digital conference. Today, we are so fortunate to have with us Margaret Johnston Clark, who is the Global Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer of L'Oreal Group, headquartered in Paris. Welcome to Margaret. I will share a bit about her background and, and her biography. Uh, this is meant to be completely interactive, so we are going to be encouraging questions throughout in the chat that I will then field to Margaret. Uh, but let me just tell you more about who she is. Margaret is a French-American Yale graduate with 27 years of work experience in diversity and inclusion, corporate social responsibility, philanthropy, branding, and communications. She spent more than half of her career at L'Oreal in key positions in CSR, including Deputy General Manager, of the L'Oreal Corporate Foundation and Brand Communications at Lancome and Garnier. She spent five years at LVMH as Head of Image and Integrated Communications for the Moet and Chandon House, and over six years at the nonprofit FACE, where she ran several educational programs in inner cities. She has been awarded with the National Order of Merit, and since May of 2017, Margaret has been Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for the L'Oreal Group. So before we introduce Margaret here, let's show a quick video about L'Oreal. We're all different. For example, Isabella, who's tall and dark haired, doesn't look like Laura, who's petite and blonde. Generally, we're happy about our differences. On the other hand, there are differences that we experience as small everyday humiliations. Nathan, who has to leave early to pick up his children, Tuan doesn't speak out a lot during meetings. Not because he's shy, because he's deaf. Ingrid, who's dyslexic and takes longer to write notes. Or Mike, who people say is past his prime, but who has so much to contribute. And then there are differences you can't shake. Aisha, who's Muslim and always has to voice an opinion on news about the Middle East. And all those questions in other people's eyes. Paul likes men. Priya, women. Joanna is a transgender woman, and a woman first and foremost. And all those differences you can't see, but that hurt. Ava, whose husband is violent, but she never says a word about it. Or Sid, who looks so strong, but has serious back problems. Now if we put Isabella, Tuan, Aisha, and all the others together, that's called diversity. And diversity is important to us at L'Oreal, because it creates opportunities we can't afford to miss. Each of us is a combination of so many things, different cultures, identities, and backgrounds. That's why we promote equity, so that each of us, with our differences, has the right to be treated fairly in life and at work. We also choose inclusion to take differences into account. Inclusion means enabling everyone to give their best so the company benefits from the best of everyone. It's understanding, accepting, and encouraging differences. For 20 years, L'Oreal has been formally committed to diversity and inclusion, especially with regard to disability, gender and LGBTQ+, age, and socioeconomic and multicultural origins. We are committed to fight against all forms of discrimination. We are committed to making our workplaces accessible, to trainings that help us all work together better, to eliminating the gender pay gap for people with equivalent jobs. Beyond our employees, we are committed to all our consumers and partners because we believe in inclusive beauty. Differences are a source of strength. Differences are opportunities. Supporting difference means creating excellence together we create the beauty that moves the world. Margaret, what a fantastic video that just shows how important diversity is to L'Oreal because it creates those opportunities, 
great to have you with us today. Hello, and thank you so much, Amber, and the team to have invited me and to be with all of you today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And let me just remind everyone that we have the L'Oreal Italy team is in our virtual conference, in our virtual stand. So definitely head on over there at some point throughout the day to connect with the recruiters in the stand representing L'Oreal Italy. And of course, as I mentioned already, but Margaret is here to answer any questions you might have. I have a number of questions for her to get the conversation started today. And first of all, you've had such a successful career trajectory in this area. What is it that inspired you to be involved in diversity and inclusion? I think it it's very personal. I, I wanted a, when I went to college, I wanted to then go to the Peace Corps. And uh, I ended up not doing the Peace Corps, but working for a nonprofit based here in France. Um, that was the first of its kind at the time because it wasn't solely focused on, it wasn't philanthropy. It was more about enabling uh, disadvantaged um, people from disadvantaged communities to access work. And I worked on education and on making sure that also the workplace was sufficiently inclusive. At the time, we didn't really use those terms. It was the very early 90s. So diversity was a term that existed in many Anglo-Saxon countries, but not necessarily in France. And the sense of inclusion wasn't necessarily, we talked more about equality. Uh, and uh, this is why today we're talking more and more about equity. So I think it was, uh, I don't know if it was a vocation, but it definitely, uh, I wanted to uh, to be able to, to, to really contribute and give back. What was interesting is when I joined L'Oreal in 2000, uh, I was able to really get a business experience working for brands as a communications expert and then able to really kind of try and, 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 and combine both. So it was about really focusing on what was corporate social responsibility, what was our role as a business uh, and how we could get more and more engaged beyond just philanthropy actions, but really doing doing something that could, you know, be that that could be complementary to what governments or communities or NGOs were already doing. Have been the biggest challenges? What have been the biggest challenges or the biggest opportunities that you've encountered advancing this type of work? I think um, I think the I think today the challenge is just because our consumers like our partners, but also our employees are expecting more and more companies to take a stand on certain you know, issues related to current affairs. This has been a huge mind shift. Uh, this wasn't the case a few years ago. This definitely was not the case 28 years when I, ago when I started, um, where there were private foundations, there were NGOs, and then there was the private sector that didn't necessarily get involved. So I think, um, What's great about my job is that we have challenges that come up all the time, but also we need to uh, we need to be sufficiently agile as a business to really be able to listen to our what our people what our, our our teams are expecting, but also what our consumers are expecting, and what is genuinely you know coherent to our culture, our corporate culture, and and what we can give back, so that it doesn't come across as a social washing or green washing or pink washing, but it's genuinely embedded in our strategy. So I think, for instance, when in 2018 um, I decided to, we had been working on gender equity for many years. We uh, decided to. Um, because we have 69% of women in our workforce, I thought it was really important to tackle domestic violence. And I thought that this was something that we needed to tackle because we were addressing many issues about harassment. It was after the Me Too movement, so we had been in a complete mode of transparency and, and sharing the amount of harassment cases in the workplace and the responses from the company to all of this. But we also, we had, completely disregarded stories from our survivors and people who were going through domestic violence. And so a lot of internal, internally, I got a lot of feedback saying, well, this is a private matter. This should not be part of the agenda. I completely disagree. Um, and uh, so that was one of the challenges. And I, was, I decided to go and see our CEO and to explain it to him and to say, this is the only safe space for a survivor to speak up and disclose and seek counsel. 
not that we're experts, but we are able to give them counsel in the sense of putting them in touch with the legal team, but mainly putting them in touch with NGOs close by so that they can go during their time at the office, take that time. So it's mainly time that we're giving mm -hmm. survivors to be able to find the best way and the best counsel to find answers to their situation. So this is something that we worked on and we went as far as becoming advocates on the topic. We created a coalition with other companies on domestic violence and we went as far as creating a domestic violence HR framework policy that was then sent out to all of our countries beginning of 2021 um, to really enable this to be kind of trickle down. So this was one of the challenges uh, which, um, which very quickly everyone onboarded and then during confinement, um, the number of cases throughout the world obviously drew a lot of attention. So, 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 so it was it was interesting because that momentum we were able to push forward, and that's when we pushed a very precise policy to help our HR teams worldwide. What a commendable accomplishment for 2021! Uh, excellent work. And we have a question from the audience. What would you identify as the greatest milestone for L'Oreal this year in 2021 that was driven by diversity and inclusion? I think our sense of purpose. Um, our company is over 100 years old. Um, we've had very strong values, very strong corporate culture, but we never really had a written sense of purpose. Our sense of purpose was published. You might have seen it um, in media, in in, 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 in all kinds of different shapes and forms, online, offline. And what's interesting is that diversity and inclusion are really part of the agenda. It's really part. So I think that's one of the, our, my biggest milestones is that it was relayed in our sense of purpose. So even though it's always been there, it's never been that explicit. Excellent. Now, I wanted to remind our audience that we do have the recruiters from the L'Oreal Italy team in the virtual stand and prepared to speak with you about those that are wishing to make a career change from a certain industry into cosmetics, as we've had one question, questions specific about work authorizations and visas for different markets. So I would strongly encourage you to head on over to the stand after Margaret's session so you can listen to her. Uh, and another question for you, Margaret. Now, according to a Human Rights Campaign Foundation report, 46% of LGBTQ plus workers say they are still closeted at work. What are some of the ways that L'Oreal shows LGBTQ plus co-workers that they can be their full selves around them and that they are valued? Well, we've put into place several things. First of all, we, in 2018, we decided, I decided that it was important that we sign um, the code of standards from the UN on LGBTQ plus rights. So that's one of the things. So it was a statement and this was a global. So we went out to all of our markets, even in the markets where it's, you know, where there, there might be legal or cultural complications vis-a-vis -vis the LGBTQ plus community. Then we decided to go beyond and to within our education offer to offer specific e-learnings, one of them being, for instance, on how to make sure to integrate, um, you know, making sure that no one from an LGBTQ community feels out, not included within the workforce, but also with partners. And from a very practical standpoint, we also went as far as putting together a um, almost like a little playbook on pronouns. Uh, to educate and upskill everyone within the company and across all functions. So this has been, this was shared. We shared it from a communications standpoint, but we also made it available on, for instance, our HR uh, intranet website, uh, which is called All HR. There's a dedicated section in diversity and inclusion in that there is, for instance, this document. The document is very short and concise, but outside of Anglo-Saxon countries, it's true that pronouns were not necessarily well mastered um, by many of our by many of our teams. So this was an easy way. So the idea is to really make sure that we have we, we put together this safe space, this inclusive workspace, especially now with hybrid work, when people do come in the to the office, they feel they need to feel absolutely respected. And the upskilling 
has been a, one of our challenges, but one of the things that's the most rewarding is making sure that all the teams are aligned on this. So whether this could be true for the LGBTQ plus community, but it could be also true for people with disabilities or people from different multicultural backgrounds. Excellent. And that pronoun handbook, I can only imagine just the challenges that it is sometimes like even the Anglo-Saxon world to do this on a global basis in other languages, uh, but very well done. There's a question that's interesting. As a diversity, inclusion, and equity team, how are you working with other departments, marketing and finance, for example? So finance, it's easy because um, we became a huge uh, asset in the sense that uh, extra financial performance has become, you know, something that look, that is absolutely part, not only part of the agenda, but on top of their agenda. So rankings, uh, uh, reputational uh, surveys, um, a lot rests upon what we do in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we work hand in hand with the um, with the financial teams for sure. Uh, and when our CEO does roadshows on financial communications, diversity, equity, and inclusion is always part of what he um, shares to, to to different stakeholders outside the company and what we do. Um, the other teams, it's interesting, um, coming, not being really myself an HR professional, I, I, I'm part of the HR family because this is where we sit, but uh, one of the things I wanted to do when we arrived, when I arrived four years ago in this position was to really create as many synergies as possible across all function. So I've done a lot of, of uh, kind of going and sharing what we do and making sure that people got a, a vested interest in what we were doing. So we did, we did it with brands. They were doing it without necessarily uh, knowing it because we create beauty products for men, women, and people of all genders around the world. But it was important to sometimes reiterate certain things. And this is where we've co-constructed a lot of things. So whether it be from an HR perspective, for instance, making sure that when we um, reach a certain management level, that inclusive management is actually part of their training because it's not a given. To put together diverse teams our recruitment teams do a fabulous job worldwide. They're all trained on unconscious biases. They know how to reach and go and, and get the best talents from all over the world. Nevertheless, what's important is then to keep it internally and to make sure that the all talents are promoted and and uh, and uh, and, uh, and get the right um, you know the right the, the right trainings and the right um, feedback. So this is something that can only be done if the managers have an inclusive leadership upskilling. So this is something that we've worked together. And with brands, for instance, we worked together, if I come back on the domestic violence topic, we worked hand in hand with Yves Saint Laurent Beauté, one of our beauty brands. Saint Laurent uh, created Love is Not Abuse a campaign last year uh, in 2020, and it's gone global in over 25 markets uh, and, and, and many more to come. And this is something where we really worked together because they were realized that it was part it was very close to their sense of purpose as a brand and how we could bring it to life as a key DEI topic. Excellent. Now you're speaking about collaborating very positively with all of these departments. A question from the audience was DNI always a focus at L'Oreal or was there some resistance within the company that you had to overcome first and if so, how did you do it? So my job was made very easy because um, my position, uh, my team was created by the previous CEO. Um, so Jean-Paul Lagon, when he uh, became the head of L'Oréal USA in 2001, created the position in the United States in 2002. When he moved back to France to become CEO, he created the position here at headquarters. So it covered France, but it also covered the world. And little by little, we created DEI leads worldwide. So we have one in Italy who's fabulous, and we have, we're have we very fortunate to have a network of amazing and dedicated employees. Um, so by the fact that our leadership endorses this position or created this position, well, it made my job much easier. What's true is that I joined the company, the company, the 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 the, the team in 2017, the summer of 2017. What I noticed is when it, in September, when Me Too became a global 
event in 2020 when Black Lives Matter became a global cause, when um, when all of these current affairs became took over the discussion worldwide, outside of the United States, really became global. It enabled us to have that kind of uh, not only a momentum, but it enabled us to even go even quicker and faster because suddenly it was on everyone's mind. So we did a lot of listening circles. We did a lot of really of, of, of listening to our employees of what they wanted, what they expected L'Oreal Group to do, but also our consumers. And um, we had to, in the sense, because uh, the matter of urgency had become very tangible. So this is this is something that has changed and, and, and has made, in a sense, I want to say my job easier. I, I don't know if that's the right answer, but definitely. Um, and then we just need to keep being creative and working on many topics to embrace everyone. So we've talked a lot about gender, but, you know, disability um, obviously is a huge topic. Uh, multicultural origin is a massive topic as well, but also generations. And we're working with all of that as well on uh, and, and our brands on making sure how we the type of spokespeople we want to have who are over 55 and that they, you know, Jane Fonda is wonderful, but that's, she can't represent the whole anti-age category, skincare category. So how do we do that? And how do we really, um, you know, have a, an inclusive beauty? So. Excellent. Now, Margaret, there's a number of eight very specific HR questions, and I know mm -hmm. you're part of the HR family. Again, there will be recruiters throughout the day at the virtual stand, uh, sure. so you could direct many of those specific questions. But there are a number of questions about what are those key competencies or abilities that you look for in talent at L'Oreal? Uh, if you want to talk a bit about that, and especially for those that are looking to make a career change from another industry. Mm -hmm. Well, what is it that, and we know competition is fierce and we're always working with our talent to get them to set themselves apart. So what is it that that would set talent apart for you from for you? And even if you think about hiring from your for your own team, I'm curious to know how, how are you ensuring that those you're bringing on to the team are inclusive in in their mentality? So maybe just talk about what it is that you look for in your talent. Yes, because I think Matisse, Akun, and the Italy uh, recruitment team will do a fabulous job of explaining what type of um, uh, profiles and what type of opportunities we have within the group. Um, what I can say is that um, I think we talk a lot about, you know, this entrepreneurial spirit at L'Oreal. It's something. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's about seizing opportunities about being proactive. There's something very, so um, competitive is not necessarily the term I would use, but I think uh, the sense of being creative, being kind of um, outgoing. Um, but then again, you know, introverts and people who are quiet are also wonderful assets. So I don't think there's an easy way for me to answer this. I think diverse profile would be my answer. Uh, we have we have to cover such a wide range of beauty routines, of beauty expectations, of very intimate ways that people look at when you work on skincare, on your hair, on um, or body for that matter. Um, we we there's not one answer. So what we are what we're looking for at L'Oreal is really to have diverse perspectives come together. So I think one of the key assets for me and for the group is that people know how to listen to one another, that there's not, you know, someone who would come and impose a certain way of working, of thinking, of seeing things, would not be able to basically work as a team. I think cooperation is key within the team, but also we are a company that is over 85,000 people. And we have, usually you don't report back to one person, you report back to several. So that capacity to work as a network and to be able to connect people, I think liking, enjoying people is probably one of the biggest assets. Um, and then being mindful and being the sense of, um, of, of inclusion is important. You know, really being able to 
take into account people's differences and, and leveraging that. So I think listening and empathy is really important too. Excellent. Now, you yourself, you have a global profile being French American. We have talent that come from more than 700 schools in 92 countries. And a specific question about what is it that L'Oreal expects from people with previous experience outside of the UK or EU? Is it important to be an expert in these markets? No, I mean, we, we, we recruit people who are out of school, who have experience. I joined the company 21 years ago and I was 30 years old at the time. That was kind of a people, it was quite rare to join L'Oreal with a, you know, a first, first few years out of college uh, working. Today, that's quite common. So there's not one answer. You do not need to be a beauty expert. We have people coming in who come from different different walks of life, different experiences. What's important is how you tackle. You do need to be interested in the beauty industry. It's a plus uh, because we are the product, the, the products we create uh, and the experiences we create in retail. Uh, well, you, the, the, there is quite a lot of passion involved. So I think that that's something that would be my only recommendation, but you don't need to come from the beauty industry be able to show that passion somehow, I guess, on the CV or in the interview process. And you mentioned retail as well. So uh, excellent. Very good insight. Now, there's a number of individuals in our community that search for inclusive companies and organizations during the job search. It's, it's important for them. It's on their minds. What are your recommendations? How to go about it? Uh, we know that L'Oreal is, is inclusive. Is L'Oreal part of any uh, organizations or consortiums, or how would you suggest those talent that are looking for an organization such as L'Oreal, even if it weren't L'Oreal, uh, mm -hmm. find those? I think I think um, I think these are great questions to ask during an interview. Before the interview, I think there's also ways of of seeing how um, <clears throat> the company talks about diversity, equity, and inclusion on their website what kind of ranking they're part of, what kind of coalition they're part of. So for instance, if I talk about L'Oreal, uh, we never thought of doing that till, uh, well, when I joined the team, I was kind of amazed that we never actually published anything we did in terms of diversity and inclusion. It was because it didn't, it, 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 we did a huge amount, but we related it simply the annual report, which is really focused more to financial public. So what we ended up doing is we ended up actually creating a dedicated section um, on this topic within the website. And we see that this is something that is important and that needs to be regularly updated to also and, and, and with specific articles and, and links to certain things that we decide to promote or push. So obviously, this is an opportunity we take every international day. Uh, so there might be an international day on um, on domestic violence or on disability or so this is an opportunity to raise and 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 to inform also our future you know um, potential recruities so 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 I think what's important is that um, you look at how the company tackles these topics and what type of proofs and what type of examples we we like to give very specific examples um, and in fact, the film that I shared with you at the beginning was done, I did it for internal purposes at first. I wanted to make sure that everyone was on board. I've updated it since I created it. I created it in 2018 when I arrived and I've updated it in 2021. What's interesting is that we also felt it was important to share it with, uh, with people exactly like all of the, the people joining this event today. So that's why it's on our website. So it, there's full disclosure in a sense. So I think there's something very genuine. And in terms of the rankings and coalitions that you mentioned, any specific that any indexes that well, are we, to take a look at? Yeah. So 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 today worldwide, the one thing that can be really measured is gender. Uh, that is, I should make make it clear. It's women and men. Okay. So, um, so there's a there are a few um, indexes that that exist, such as the Bloomberg Gender Equality Index, or Equilib, 
Uh, there's also the Refinitive uh, Diversity and Inclusion Index, which is also um, uh, global. And this enables us to, to be ranked among other companies. So it's also a good way for us to know how we fit in because uh, and, and, and what do we need to, to, to add. We also, um, to about more than half, 60% of our subsidiaries, the big subsidiaries like Italy and others, uh, go through gender certifications. So we also work with organizations like EDGE or like GIS. And every other year we get, we have to, uh, we have not to apply, but to demonstrate where we stand in terms of gender equity. And we then get a third party who comes and gives us a certification. So it would be Bureau Veritas or it would be Flossert or so they would come in and give us a grade basically. So this enables us also to move forward and, and to also benchmark ourselves among not just people within our industry, but just other global companies. So I think this is very important. Excellent starting points for them. Thank you for those tips. A question from the audience. What steps or competencies are required to be part of and work in diversity, equity, and inclusion department? What, so what, you, what steps or competencies do you look for in someone to be a part of your department, diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, a great sense of, I think you have to be committed. You have to be passionate about the topic. You have to be passionate about, I don't know, maybe not passionate, but daring. I would, um, I love to be able to challenge the teams and to say yes. When we talk to our marketing teams and we're looking right now at different options to screen all of our advertisement to make sure that we have no stereotypes, that we have no um, bias when creating this content, whether it's advertisement, whether it's social media content, these are things where you have to be able to say, to bring everyone along, to find the right asset. So we're benchmarking different tools right now, and we're looking at how we can make this feasible, scalable. So I think the ambition of, uh, of, uh, of contributing to something Big, to get the support and to be able to share it and share that enthusiasm. And this is what our DEI leads do worldwide. And this is why my job is so much fun is that we have all these amazing relays and then we have great initiatives. And what I do is basically I collect all of these great initiatives that are made in countries. And then I make sure that the other countries know about them. So at the end of the day, I contribute to the vision to a few important things like, you know, creating co business coalitions on certain taboo topics. I talked about gender-based violence, but it could be like integrating refugees in the workplace or others where we take a stand. But most of my job is just listening and embracing what is being tested locally. So for instance, um, in the United States, we, our teams tested a campaign in 2016 called Break the Silence. Uh, I thought it was amazing when I arrived and I decided to really make sure and leverage it everywhere. So Break the Silence is about enabling people within the workplace to speak up and to disclose their disability. So this touches upon obviously mental health issues, but also invisible disability, but also visible disability and all of the stigma attached to it. So these are things that you know, and those discussions, and then we've adapted it and in, in, in each country takes it and tweaks it and makes it local. That's a perfect lead in to another question we have from the audience about mental health. How does L'Oreal support mental health care? Are topics related to employees with high functioning mental health issues raised by your department? So mental health has been part of our agenda for many years. Um, I have to say the UK and Ireland team were quite forward with thinking on this topic. Uh, so they created a lot of listening groups for employees to speak up about mental health. So this is something it was called, the, the campaign was called uh, Beat the Stigma. So we, we, we shared it, we celebrated in 2018, we have internal competitions. So we shared it and we made it global. Um, huge hit in Dubai. We kind of like, it, it really went global. Um, then one of our biggest brands, Maybelline, that you 
are maybe familiar with, uh, decided to support mental health issues by uh, really uh, focusing on um, on a cause dedicated to promoting uh, or to, to, to speaking up on, on depression, anxiety. So they support in each country where Maybelline is a local NGO on this topic, but it also enables that discussion to take place within the workplace. So to have workshops and we have an e-learning, for instance, which we launched with Maybelline on mental health issues. So this is also a way of upskilling all of our employees and to really get it part of the, you know, part of our business agenda as well. So it's not just talking to our consumers, it's also really making sure that we tackle the issue internally. Excellent to see that's been part of agenda, the agenda for so long. Uh, a question from Africa. Uh, as a young African woman that is passionate about the beauty industry, I would like to know what the future of L'Oreal is within Africa and how can individuals like me contribute? Well, we're very much present in, 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 in certain sub-Saharan African countries like Kenya, like South Africa. Um, Mo uh, we have a plant in South Africa. We have also brands in South Africa. So we have quite a bit team. And then also in North Africa, we have also different teams in uh, in Morocco, for instance. Um, how can you contribute? Well, uh, it really depends where you're located and what type of uh, and what type of of uh, of, uh, of job you, you, you want to pursue. Because we have, in, in the case, for instance, if I just focus on South Africa, quite a variety of positions. Um, so I have no idea what's vacant today and what's available, but there are many different um, amazing opportunities in, in Africa today, absolutely. Excellent. Now, a question about advice for young graduates or recent graduates as they think about promoting diversity, <coughs> inclusion, and representation in their own careers, much as you have done. I think um, I think it's a wonderful time to get engaged in this topic because um, I've been lucky at L'Oreal to, as I said, have worked in this team that was created way before I joined it. So. Um, I see a lot of companies out, so I'm not talking about the US or the UK, but a lot of companies, for instance, in continental Europe, where it wasn't necessarily, there wasn't a dedicated team to on diversity and inclusion. Um, and what's great is that because it's such an expectation of, from consumers, but also different, and, and obviously employees, uh, I'm seeing more and more uh, creations. So I'm getting a lot of peers who are who are creating different um, entities or, or, or departments in other companies. Um, it tends to be in bigger companies. So maybe the challenge will be in smaller companies. What does that job, what is going to look like? But I do think there are going to be more and more opportunities um, really to create that kind of to put it on the agenda of the business, to really the business case is important beyond this is the right thing to do, which we all agree, uh, but also what is the role of companies today? If companies don't try, for instance, if I give you another concrete example, we started analyzing pay gap at L'Oreal in 2007, gender pay gap. We did it here at HQ and in France because this is where it was. we could look at of photography, of exactly a, a wide variety of jobs, a wide variety of, uh, the age range was very wide, the, 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 the college degrees were very wide. We were able to close the gap a couple of years ago because each year we were measuring it. We didn't wait for the French government, for instance, to pass a law, which they ended up doing quite recently, like the UK, to measure it, obliging companies to disclose if they have a gender pay gap. So I think companies have a wonderful playing field of testing. And I often think of our job almost like um, almost like in a creative lab where we can test different things, see how it works, and then share them with other with other companies, obviously, but also with government. So for instance, the gender pay gap today, we have developed a tool enabling all of our HR teams worldwide to measure the gap and to close it if there is a gap still, because unfortunately we do have certain cases where we still have a very small, but we still have a little gap. 
So we still have a lot of things to do, but this is where we have a great role because we have the means to try this and the support. And then it's great if it goes through a legislation, that's wonderful, but it's like women in leadership. We didn't wait for quotas to happen for obliging companies to have a certain amount of women in leadership positions. We thought it was important to test it and to make sure that we were giving access to women, men, and people of all genders at all levels of the company. Excellent, and I'm glad you mentioned that uh, your stance on the gender pay gap. It's a hot topic and I was i was about to ask you. Now, <laughs> you, you've talked a lot about what you're doing internally and towards the employees. Uh, I'm curious to know your diversity, inclusion, equity stance and strategy and the actions that you're taking and how it's embedded in your strategic framework towards the consumers and suppliers. Well, it's embedded in everything we do. So my action focuses on employees, consumers, and external stakeholders. So they could be NGOs with whom we work or they could be suppliers. We have a dedicated team, in fact, called Solidarity Sourcing that solely does this and we work with them worldwide. So this is not just something here at HQ, it's really worldwide. Who do we work with? What type of suppliers and do we share common values? Um, we work uh, obviously on uh, making sure that we listen to our consumers, what they expect from a stand of what type of product they're expecting to get from us, but also what kind of, of environmental footprint, what kind of social footprint. So we're, we do a huge amount of social listening, but also of, of just, it, we have evaluation centers that are dedicated to watching, learning and exchanging. So this is something that we, we've we really built into our business case and making sure that diversity, equity, and inclusion is respected, but also part of the agenda is absolutely fundamental at all steps of the way. We do put a lot of also specific energy on education, as, I, as you might have noticed internally, making sure that everyone is speaking the same, is understanding or, or, or has the same amount of knowledge. This is important because semantics has gotten quite a complicated and touchy topic because in the past we were a French company and we sort of, you know, we spoke French everywhere. Then we started speaking English. Then we started promoting local and, and, and enabling everyone to speak. So today it's important that when we align on a tagline or on, um, or on a concept that we all have the same understanding that we don't use certain terms that might be offensive to others. So there's an approach of being very humble constantly in what we do because we can make mistakes, but also making sure that our tone of voice is the right one. So that's something that we also push at all levels to make it kind of happen. Excellent, and you mentioned being humble and I just wanted to ask because I hear this increasingly from our recruiters that they're looking for humility more and more. And so is that something that you look for in your candidates? Yes, I say humility, I mean, uh, being humble because um, we all have unconscious biases. And when we say that we're a French cosmetic company and that we're the leader on the market, it tends to come across as pretentious for many reasons, because of the French uh, heritage, because of because we're number one and we like to say it, because we're competitive and we do have that inter that that kind of competitive streak within us, which keeps us, uh, which is oftentimes incredibly positive. So we need to be very careful and mindful of of making sure that we also need to um, revise the way we speak to our candidates. So it's not so much what we're expecting from candidates. I was speaking more as, a, as an employer, that posture we need to make sure. And, you know, it's interesting. We, we launched um, last year, 18 months ago, a charter to work with our law firms worldwide on gender equity. And in this charter, we ask the partners the law, the, the legal partners we have worldwide, we say, we would like you to abide by the, this is something that is important for us is gender equity. So we would like you to, um, you know, make sure that if you have women in your 
teams that they have access to maternity leave, that your leadership is has an you know an equity a gender equity, that um, you don't make take a, that you make sure that that there's the same treatment that, that there's a fair treatment, and then in that charter, L'Oreal also states what we are going to do vis-a-vis -vis them. So it's not just a us telling them how to be with us to be so you know diverse and and and, and inclusive, it's also an approach of saying we will make sure that we do not give you, for instance, deadlines after 7 p.m. or after 6 p.m. or meetings, or asking you to spend an all nighter to pull an all nighter, or asking you not to take vacation because this is such a big deal and we're the client and we need it immediately. So that posture is very clearly stated and that enables us also to make sure that we remain humble and and obviously you know just serious but um anyway i just wanted Excellent. to no those are those are great and very tangible examples uh, just going back to the inclusion of lgbtq plus communities yeah. uh do you, can you specify a bit more in terms of parental leave and co-parent oh, yes. leave and any more initiatives like that so absolutely. So beyond the e-learnings, beyond the different statements and, and, and the support that we give to our teams worldwide, but also to, by the way, our consumers, because I talked about mental health with Maybelline or Saint Laurent with domestic violence, but we've worked a lot on um, making sure that, you know, homophobia, transphobia and uh, is tackled by some of our brands like NYX and others. Um, Co-parent, very interesting. In 2013, we decided to, within, we have a program called Share and Care, which is worldwide, and which is kind of, um, which enabled all of our countries to offer women on our teams who were going through pregnancy or who were, um, were becoming a mother uh, to have 14 weeks of paid leave. So we decided over the years to extend this to fathers. And the important step that we made very vocal was to make sure that it wasn't just fathers, but it was really co-parents. So we have a minimum of six weeks of paid leave for all co-parents, uh, adoption included, but um, so it could be a mother, a father, or a, a, or, or someone of, of a non-binary. You don't need to, to demonstrate, you just need to share the fact that you're having a child coming into your household. How that ch child came about, if you were the, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. And this is a minimum of six weeks paid leave. So, for instance, in countries like um, the U.S., for instance, they went to eight weeks of paid leave. In certain countries like in the Nordics, in, 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 it's much more because culturally it's, it's, it's a completely, it's a wonderful and, and, and amazing example of, 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 of absolute gender equity where men and women really do share everything at the beginning of the life of their kids so so or or couples but this was a very big change so yes absolutely uh in terms of of of, of social benefits um the lgbtq plus community this is something that we're looking into even to go further beyond um beyond right. parental leave absolutely it sounds like with so many of these initiatives that you are very much pioneers in what you're doing with many of these policies are you working closely with companies across other industries? Yeah, yeah, we are. We're, 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 we're I don't know if we're pioneering. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know if we're pioneers in, in, in what we do, but what what's sure is that when we do it, when we test it, we really do have a vested interest in it. So we really apply ourselves to make it happen and to get this beyond the test and learn approach is making sure that we have tangible conclusions so that we can roll it out and make it big. Um, so yes, this is something that, and sometimes it's important to, to, to do it together. Um, in 2015, I, I worked a lot on refugees um, and making sure how we could support the integration of refugees in our, in our, in our workforce. Um, we've worked with many different NGOs and uh, and and today I work with one global one called Tent Partnership for Refugees, um, and it's very interesting because this is something where I get a lot of support by being part of Tent because it's it, it was created it's created by a businessman, and the whole purpose is to bring companies together. So this is something that we really um, where we can even go further. So we have taken and we've become advocates 
on this topic, which I'm not entirely sure I could have done alone, uh, even if our CEO is completely behind it and, and, and very proactive, I'm not sure it would have been as strong as bringing a collective of people together. So yes, business Excellent. coalitions, I think, yeah, are doing it together are, are, can be a really great thing. The same with sexism. I'm sorry, I'll give you a, yes, a last please. example. Um, because we work in the beauty industry, um, well, a lot of people assume that, you know, we have a lot of women, we have a lot of people from the LGBTQ plus community and that it's all fine and dandy. Well, turns out that obviously like anywhere else, there's certain behaviors that is that are just not acceptable. Uh, we talked about homophobia, transphobia, but it could be sexism. Um, so we came together with two other companies, EY and Accor Hotel, and together the three of us, we worked on a pilot in France. Today we have over 115 companies and we've gone global. And the, the, the principle is very simple. This campaign is about raising awareness internally on everyday microaggressions linked to sexism. All the little sentences, the, the, the looks, the, the approaches, maybe even a nonverbal approach that could be perceived as offensive. And yes, we do have a lot of women in the workplace, but no, they did not necessarily feel comfortable speaking up. So by coming together and having also these perspectives from two other companies with very different uh, cultures, but also uh, type of, 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 of jobs within the organization, we came together with a very simple campaign with eight principles. And the idea was really to bring people together and to by reading it, just upskilling. And then we went as far as, again, doing a training, but something that you can do alone. You don't need to go in class. And then having at least once a year, a full campaign within the workplace with facts and figures, uh, just to talk about sexism and just to make sure that everyone realized that this was something that was really to eradicate, that we couldn't keep, you know, just turning a blind eye. So, so yes, I think coming together with others is always a plus. Excellent. Now, first of all, many of the audience, I believe they came because they wanted to work for L'Oreal. And now we're getting a number of comments, people that wanted to work in the area of diversity, equity and inclusion. <laughs> so a question about how can I get into the specific field without having any related work experience? I've put together a team of, um, of people who uh, are not DI experts. I myself I'm passionate about the topic. I've educated myself on the topic, but I was an English major at Yale. Uh, I did communications at the CELSA. I did not, you know, I, I so so I think I think the, the the beauty of this is 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 we're talking about human topics. So I think uh, regardless of your work experience in the past, it, there's always something a link to be made, whether you come from uh, it, it, the, as long as you're interested and in that you're invested in the topic, you should actually use what you've done in the past, whatever that expertise is, to try and start off by testing that. I did a lot of communications as my job. So by making it known, by writing guidelines, by creating campaigns, visual campaigns, by doing films like the one you saw, that's what I do because that's what I did for other brands. And this was something that was able to promote certain things about diversity and inclusion. Now it's not all, there are many things that I'm learning on the job still today and my team is, but I think um, what's wonderful is that your experience, your, your perspective, who you are will bring a lot to that function. Excellent, you speak so much about passion throughout. It's probably one of the key words that have been in so many of your talking points today. What is it that you look for on the CV to identify that passion? Is it uh, previous experience? Is it the volunteer work? Is it uh, involvement with a student group or society? Is there something specific that would uh, have something jump off the page for you and show that a candidate truly has passion to work in this industry or to work for L'Oreal? That's a really good question. Um, I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm thinking because I I don't know. It's, it's I actually don't I know. know. 
And at the same I mean, time, I think yeah. I think there's certain things about resumes that are kind of, you know, it differs so much from country to country. Um, you know, when the school system in certain parts of the world is so intense and there's no time for volunteer work or sports or theater or the arts, it would be uh, it would be difficult to compare those resumes because it doesn't mean that someone who goes to a country where they finish school at 6 p.m. and then they have to study more and they can't do all of that extracurricular curricular activity is less engaged. So I think it's more about, really, I don't think it's about the resume itself. It's a, um, I think it's about maybe what comes with the resume, the application and the words that are used to demonstrate a very genuine but interested, invested interest in, in this topic. Excellent. Now, I want to take another question from the audience mm -hmm. about L'Oreal's initiatives against discrimination based on nationality or citizenship at the workplace. Huge topic. So we don't have any, I mean, I, I shouldn't say that, but I'm sure, I, I don't think we have many discriminations against citizenship or, or, or um uh, or multicultural. Nevertheless, given current affairs and given the rays of awareness on 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 racism and 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 we've decided to tackle this issue. So in Brazil, we put together a coalition uh, of businesses again to really focus on racism, making sure that also we have a really diverse workforce, which wasn't maybe necessarily sufficiently diverse compared to the country. Where, um, where compared to Brazil, excuse me, um, we decided to. Um, we've been training. We've trained over sixty-five thousand people worldwide uh, in the last decade on diversity, inclusion, um, and equity. In this training, we really focus on discrimination, a zero tolerance discrimination policy. So we, so <clears throat> this is something that we also focus on, on all the trainings we do systematically across the range on unconscious biases. And now we're even coming out with an e-learning on racism. Uh, so we, we do tackle the topic. Um, we do make sure that it's addressed, uh, but we, we, we can't, um, I think we have to be very careful that we really make sure that we have a diverse team. In most countries, you do not, you're not able to disclose the multicultural origin. So you cannot talk in, in, in terms like in South Africa, Brazil, or the United States, where you can talk about your ethnicity. So that makes the job of, of managers and recruiters difficult because they, if there's no photo attached, you wouldn't necessarily know where and what skin color your candidates are. I think what's important is at the end, we do have to we do have to compose diverse teams. So also we are mirroring our, our consumers worldwide. Um, so yes, we we this is something that we've we've raised awareness um, over the last few decades, but we've accelerated the discussion and we've had a lot of listening circles with employees during Black Lives Matter in different parts of the world to talk about racism in the workplace. So that's not something that I would have leveraged outside, but we did listen and we did, for instance, did a dedicated e-learning on microaggressions, a term that came up a lot during Black Lives Matter discussions. So yes, we're upskilling as much as we can, but um, but we're, we, it's a complicated topic giving given, excuse me, the, the local legislations in certain countries. So we cannot measure ethnicity like we can measure gender. Such important work you've been doing, Margaret. And we're reaching the top of the hour. I just have one final question. Yes. What do you hope our audience has learned from you today? Well, I hope that they've learned that this is, um, that even if they came for L'Oreal, L'Oreal is, Definitely one of the key to successes is about really being interested genuinely in, 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 in diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I think that um, regardless of where you work, if this is a topic that is of interest to you, I think you'll be able to, to make a change, um, to change the, 
the numbers also, making sure that there are more people from different backgrounds, from different genders, from different at, at, at invisible parts of the, the organization and in leadership positions. So I think my only message is that you can definitely be part of that change. Uh, and I don't want to sound kind of uh, silly saying this, but I, I really do believe that um, you just need to find the right environment to be heard. And then you have to find the right words to 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 to, to share um, your convictions and your engagements and then test, test as well. And some of these projects might not happen and others might be wonderfully great and listening. I think the last thing is about listening and making sure we oftentimes are running ahead and trying to look at studies and seeing how we can launch such a product and, and we forget to stop and listen. So. Excellent. Take the, uh, take the pulse of your audience and really just want to congratulate you on such an incredible career that you continue having in the work, the important work that you're doing for, for your employees, for society in general. So thank you so much for being with us today. I Thank want you. to, yeah, there's been fun, great feedback from the audience and many questions about fit, specific fit and career change and being able to work for L'Oreal. So again, I would like to remind everyone that L'Oreal will be at their stand throughout the day. And also they are inviting you at 4 p.m. CEST to a webinar on what it is like working for L'Oreal. So that will Perfect. answer so many of the questions <laughs> that have gone unanswered. So now what I want to do, and thank you once again, Margaret, it's been such a great pleasure to have you better, and thank you for sharing. And thank now we will hear much. from AB InBev a word from our sponsors, and after that, we will be sharing the winners from yesterday's Instagram giveaway. So just a word from AB InBev now. It started with a challenge, a challenge to elevate our voice, to stand out from the crowd, to communicate what we stand for, what makes us unique. We reminded ourselves of who we are. We are AB InBev. Dreaming big is in our DNA. Brewing the world's most loved beers, building iconic brands, and creating meaningful experiences is what inspires us. Our people are curious, bold, and resilient. We're ambitious. We see challenges as opportunities push boundaries and thrive under pressure. We are owners building a company to last, empowered to lead real change, deliver results, and grow at the pace of our talent. We work hard and we win together. This is what Challenge Accepted means to us and we're proud to bring it to life across our markets globally. AB InBev, Challenge Accepted. For those of you not following us yet on Instagram, at Get Hired, that is where you will see the winners from yesterday's giveaway. And stay tuned to our Instagram account for more challenges. Thank you very much for joining the digital conference. I look forward to welcoming you from 4 to 5 p.m. CEST today for CV clinic number two of the day that I will co-host with Julien Bavinkov from Audencia Business School in France. So that is your chance to join. We will share the email address to which you would need to send your CV for a chance of having an express live review from a recruiter perspective of your CV. So hope to see you there today at 4 p.m. CEST. Thank you very much.